I think that's, that's what's so enthralling about these installation pieces, or, or also some of the, the three-dimensional wall pieces, is that they seem to create a problem of interpreting process. At, at the apprehension of what's in front of you, you realize that you're looking at something that's also been grown or, or shifted or been delicately um, restored and that, you know, there is actually no uh, birth moment. There's only a kind of a, a description of a, of a struggle between creative, destructive, and almost kind of reconstructive processes, and that you're always looking at several of those things at once without there being any, uh, you, you, can't back, you can't make a back formation of a narrative out of it. You can't say, oh, well, this just depicts this interruption or this conflict. In, in fact, it's, um, it's always a little stranger than that, or a lot stranger. Hopefully, I mean, <laughs> I mean, ultimately, there can be these um, individual narratives that one could attach to a particular project, yeah. even though there's a lot of crossover with the materiality and the, the you know, using materials that are going from one uh, piece to another, which involves the smaller wall studies as well as their relationship to the bigger installation work, even though it's, you know, it takes on a completely different form. But the essence of a lot of them is the violent situation appearing to happen, even though it hasn't happened. It's all been crafted. It's all been, you know, kind of carefully sculpted. They're not based out of any direct story. It's almost yeah. like, what could there be possibly different stories that one could bring to each project? I was delighted by your work before I made any real inquiry <laughs> into its origins or, or, or ask you for any suggestions about, about how, I, how I think about it, how I contextualize it. Partly because I, I saw it in terms of the violations of the body and shifts between the materiality of the body and machines that I was familiar with through films by John Carpenter and David Cronenberg and, um, I mean, I think those two prom most probably, but that there was a kind of a, uh, a phenomenon that seemed to me really typical of our generation of being anxious, but also thrilled <laughs> about the, the kind of um, techno horror or bio horror lexicon, let's say, of forms and ways of making you excited and freaked out. Yeah. And then it felt to me that you were you were totally responsive to that in in your work, and, but you'd also uh, absorbed it into a very specific gallery language. <laughs> the conversation directly with sci-fi and the relationship to props from a science fiction film that comes up often, and it's it's mm -hmm. been there since I was a student. That was always a bit of a, a natural language that I started exploring, and to see if this particular kind of language can shift towards one context or another. In the gallery space, there's, there's the typical context of the white cube, and so right. somehow this became always uh, a logical intervention that sometimes involved putting things inside the wall or turning the wall into something else. For me, as a writer, when I've thought about my attraction to iconographic impossible objects, which begins for me with, with you know, in a way, with Kubrick's monolith, or also with the image of the spaceship itself, mm -hmm. or the, the bathospheric spaceship also in 2001, mm -hmm. the, the pod that floats through space, and that this, uh, this image, which is very post-human in some ways, also connects to me to some of the disembodied uh, kind of anti-material image images in in fiction attract me so much. Uh, things like the Golden Bowl and Henry James, mm -hmm. the kind of uh, iconographic object that, that hovers into the world of the um, pure pure symbolic, immaterial sphere. But it, one of the things that um, happens next is after that icon becomes celebrated, then the only thing to do is to kind of retrieve it for the idea of function for the body, to reinsert, reinvigorate it with uh, something more gritty or more human, to confess that it, that it does interact with our world.
mm. you know, rematerialize it. And one of the things that, um, you know, when I talk about a relationship to minimalism, it seems like your work is partly about a, um, some, in some ways, a, a possibly a satirical or, or, or hostile, <laughs> or both, uh, intervention on the sublime uh, post-human ideology of minimalism that says, well, actually, we're going to have to get fascinated with how our bodies interact with these things. The physical interruption process of the making is going to be the subject. We're not going to go into a perfect golden bowl mm -hmm. uh, or, or untouchable cube floating, you know, dematerialized cube floating. One of the earlier origins was to imagine some strange hybrid of perhaps a heavy metal song that mixed with a video game that mixed with a horror film. And some constellation of those three kind of strange directions of, of pop culture. Well, but also the, uh, the, the interest in the enigmatic towering artifact. I mean, in a way, the missing piece of the triangle I described between Kubrick's monolith and gold, the Golden Bowl is the uh, presence, the, the weird sculpture on the Led Zeppelin jacket, right? That everyone's looking at with awe. And for many people our generation, that might be your first encounter with the proposal that there should be like an impossible object of reverence, right? Before you encounter one in a museum. Somehow with a lot of the projects, I, I like thinking about the removal of real experience as much as possible and occasionally come to terms with the fact that these things can be built or made to, um, to look like they're almost going to get real. <laughs> or I should say that like if, like if they were to get closer to a realer experience, they'd have to get back to 2D. They'd have to actually remove themselves from a 3D experience and from an actual physical um, human experience of, of seeing them. And so there's a, almost like an embodied failure to a lot of the projects, uh -huh. which they are starting to accept. The they describe their own impossibility. Exactly. Yeah. They describe their own impossibility and they function primarily as props and they don't they don't really need to get beyond that. Now I can go ahead and start photographing them and making films dealing with them and maybe they even get closer to a realistic experience mm -hmm. or even can refer to more realistic experiences. But that that's that's not the territory that seems as interesting for most of them. Whereas I've never stepped into making films or right. having Right. to really push it that that's, far. That's yeah. interesting. It reminds me of a, a conversation that I've, I've, I've had with uh, the photographer uh, Gregory Crudson, yeah, sure. whose, whose work is constantly referred to in terms of being suggestive of film tableaus. To explore the implicit narrative would be to destroy the, uh, the, the zone where he was actually most interested. It sounds, it's it, you're reminding me of that. One of the most exacting areas of your operation is the tension between the possibility that these things will have a punchline or be or provoke humor, but they they retain an austerity or a, a a degree of risk or or anxiety that uh, keeps you uh, in a space that's just short of the release of humor. I mean, unfunny jokes is the wrong word for them, but they're sort of the possibility of a resolving into jokes seems to me to be poised just short of that uh, that experience so that we uh, we feel we feel drawn to, to, to make that move but 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 di but it's also uh, disqualified or disallowed mm -hmm. it's funny I mean with, with I don't think there's ever been a project where I've really thought okay this is going to make everyone laugh mm -hmm. you know and it's somehow if there is a, a a smile or, or a release of, of a laugh or, or whatever concerning a project that I, I almost feel that if, if I'm successful in getting there it's because there's perhaps a more roundabout way of getting there and a lot of it has to do with the perhaps the uncanny relationship that you have to such a freaky experience or like seeing yeah. something that's just, just blatantly absurd and mm -hmm. you know like when you encounter absurd situations and it really doesn't matter what art form this is, you're, you're gonna you're gonna be titillated by it to yeah. a certain degree. And somehow that that, that feels like a, su a successful territory to try to actually pull 
another or push another button or push another nerve right. for not just an audience but for myself. But it's definitely not in the foreground. It was towards the end of my studies probably that I was starting to learn Photoshop and I, I, I'd say if there was any computer tool that feels the most connected to what's going on, it might be Photoshop where I can take an image of something that is real or you know, taken from a real experience or something even that's appropriated and allow the, a transformation that just creates impossible situations. So stretch it so that it becomes... Of course. I mean, the possibility. There's so many tools, of course, yeah. for doing whatever, whether it's pixelating or blurring, smudging, you know, you name it, or inverting. And, but at the same time, I, I don't take any of it too seriously. Like, I'm not interested in the program necessarily of what the photorealists have been doing, trying to actually create that, that level of hyper-reality um, uh, to the point where it needs to imitate something perfectly. Sometimes I'm feeling like a, like a, I'm trying to build a spaceship out of dinosaur bones or something. <laughs> it's, like it's like there's some ridiculous uh, attempts to, to, to take things that are perhaps archaic and, and not even um, um, at all relating to 21st century art language mm -hmm. and what is still possible with that. And so is it, there still? Yeah. It's like there's a kind of recalcitrance in the material that you're married to. You actually are seeking some sort of uh, fluid or deceptive uh, magical procedure. You, you, you want to stay entrenched in the dinosaur bone uh, language, right? There's a vulnerability to it, and there's this thing that's, you know, it's made and it maybe, it, maybe it will not exist forever, and maybe it's um, really about a temporary experience. I think that's an extremely good note to end on. That's <laughs> great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Happy birthday, Jonathan just turned 35. Yeah. <laughs>